All right, good morning, everyone. This is Lauren Wenzel at NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and uh, we're happy to be hosting this webinar today with EBM Tools Network and OCTO. Uh, and with us today, we have Paul Buckley uh, from the UK, who is going to be talking about the implications of climate change for managing coastal and marine protected habitats and species. Um, so Paul, really glad you can be here. I will introduce Paul Thank in a you. moment. Um, but before I do, I'm just going to remind you all that uh, this is an hour long webinar. We will have the presentation and then we will have plenty of time for questions and comments. So please do use the chat or the Q&A uh, templates to provide your questions so that we can make sure to have a conversation about all of these ideas as after we go through the presentation. Uh, so Paul works at the Science to Policy Interface, communicating the impacts of climate change to end users. He is the program manager of the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership in the UK and helps draw together impacts evidence from across the scientific community and translates it for non-specialist audiences. He also works with industry and conservation agencies to support adaptation and has led work as part of EU projects on wider ocean literacy and marine climate change and public perception. So welcome, Paul, and I will turn it over to you. Lovely, well, thank you for that introduction and thanks everybody for attending, um, attending this webinar. Um, I know it's quite early-ish in the morning over in the States at the moment, but it, it made for a fairly reasonable time over here. So the talk today is probably gonna take about um, 20 minutes or, or so, I would have thought so. I think we'll be easily wrapped up within the hour that we've got. So by way of introduction, then, you know, it's certainly well established that changes in sea temperature, storms and waves, salinity, stratification, acidification, um, change in oxygen levels and changes to runoff, um, leading to differences in inputs of nutrients and pollutants from the land, are having significant impacts on coastal and marine habitats and species. Certainly this is becoming increasingly well documented by the IPCC and also at the regional and local scale. So with these changes going on, it might certainly be expected that these could have implications for the effectiveness of the legislation that we have to protect marine biodiversity. So bearing this in mind, um, in the UK a few years back, we were tasked through the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, more specifically, we tried to review relevant international and national obligations and consider how they might already be or might be able to in the future take account of climate change impacts. Um, in particular, we took a look at climate change impacts on um, MPAs and UK MPAs, the wider kind of network that they sit within and in particular, the features that they protect and thinking about climate change might affect those. So looking at kind of through the MPA lens seemed a good way of taking this type of work forward because certainly in the UK context, MPAs are relevant to a wide range of obligations that we have. Um, more recently, we've taken some of this work forward and looked at some selected features, that's both species and habitats, um, looking in more detail about climate change impacts and thinking about management responses that might be required. So whilst the focus of this work and the discussion is really around the UK context, then the principles certainly have wider applicability. So just to give a very brief background in terms of what the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership is, um, it's quite a mature partnership in the UK. It was established back in 2005 as a broad-based partnership. We have about 25 different member organisations that really was set up to provide a coordinating framework to transfer evidence on marine climate change to decision makers and support adaptation. So it was certainly identified at the time these issues were starting to emerge and we wanted to know more about it, but there was no one providing that collating role and doing that translation for end users. So in the context of the topic being discussed today, and I appreciate the table and the text is quite small here. Um, I, and can assure you that all the slides won't be like this, but just wanted to give a flavor in terms of the um, amount of information that we were starting to go through here. So certainly looking across these different obligations and we considered about 21 of them in total was no mean feat. There's certainly a lot of words that sit behind them. And really what we wanted to look at and highlight was that 
since the early 60s then you know there's been a wide range of these obligations that are in place that have an element of conservation of marine biodiversity and really just said that we use the term obligations as a bit of a broader sense so that kind of brings in conventions policies and legislations both that have relevance at the international and national scale and we wanted to look across these because really since this time they've provided the key means by which um, conservation of marine biodiversity is achieved so in terms of going through these various obligations then we've looked at both the um, original text looking for climate change references in there um, more broader references to environmental variability and then trying to look a little bit behind the actual text of the obligation itself to look at some of the complementary mechanisms that might exist to take account of climate change impact so as we go from left to right in the table then you can see that we have more blue appearing over time as as we think more widely there might be opportunities to think about climate change impacts um, as i mentioned earlier then there's certainly growing evidence of climate change impacts on marine biodiversity and um, globally and as we said earlier that that might compromise the effectiveness of these obligations but certainly looking at it within the uk context then there's only three of these obligations that directly reference climate change in their original text and two of those are specifically climate change acts so that might not be surprising so i guess the uk might be slightly unique in that context as well in terms of having some of these specific climate change acts in place and for some time now but looking more broadly across those um, wider obligations, it's clear that in many cases there are flexible mechanisms that sit behind the um, obligations that could allow climate change to be taken into consideration, even if there is absence of that direct reference in the legislation text itself. And certainly in recent decades, some of the legislation that we've had around marine biodiversity has become a lot more holistic as opposed to thinking about some things in a in a more sectoral sense which which helps it's a step in the right direction but you know at this time it's still fairly limited in how it takes account of climate change um, impacts and we wrote a, a paper about this as well as part of this this work so there's certainly more detailed information in there in the frost et al um, reference that you can see at the bottom of the screen and that includes a pretty exhaustive look across all of these obligations and as an annex as to how and um, how potentially these different obligations could take account of climate change. So looking at the um, UK context then, um, as I said earlier, there's a wide range of legislation that's relating to marine protected areas. So it does make it a useful case study thinking about the protection of marine biodiversity. Um, in this context, I'm describing marine protected areas as being parts of the sea that are partly or fully protected from anthropogenic activities. And if you look at the left hand side of the slide, then this little diagram kind of shows that there are seven types of designations that are um, relevant to, to the UK, which are considered to contribute to the, the wider marine protected area network. And that represents around 15% of the marine space um, in UK territorial waters or at least it did at the time when we initially published this map in 2016 but things do change all the time um, and each type of those designation that's shown uh, if you look on the outside of that um, diagram on the left hand side all relates to different types of, of legislation that we have to protect the marine environment so just to say a little bit more about uk marine protected areas they they exist within networks so that's to say that individual marine protected areas contribute to these broader networks, i.e. under Naturity 1000 or under the auspices of OSPAR. Um, I guess in terms of the success of these broader networks in providing resilience to climate change, you know, there's a need to kind of determine this a little bit more through appropriate monitoring programs. Um, certainly at present and in the UK um, context, there's, there's very few monitoring programs that exist, and I think more broadly worthwhile, that that provide that appropriate level of evidence to assess the functioning of marine protected areas and how they help never mind thinking about um, the climate change context as well um, uk marine protected areas are also typically multi-use rather than fully closed areas so this presents challenges in terms of trying to identify those appropriate management responses as there's, there's 
certainly need to think about how we attribute any impacts to um, those different types of factors, whether that be human activities, natural variability, or climate change, or a combination of these factors. And finally, in the UK context, then um, MPAs are, are feature-led. That's to say that they are in place to um, protect specific um, identified species and different habitats. So in total, uh, at least back in 2016, there were 1,253 um, separate designations that covered 105 different species. These are mostly birds in the UK and 74 different habitats. So all of these different features need to be assessed individually, thinking about the site level as well, against them. Um, conservation targets, particularly these features were in marine protected areas that are of interest when we're considering the impacts of climate change. So in terms of some of the initial work that we did in this area, we considered what could happen to um, designated UK features. And one of the first things that we considered was how the quality of a feature might change in a marine protected area. So, so really the, how the conditions might change that may either be enhanced or deteriorate the um, situation for um, different features in there. So uh, one of the examples that got under this is the potential impacts of ocean acidification and indeed temperature as well on cold water coral reefs in the UK. And in the UK context, and um, certainly back when we were talking 2016, there were um, seven marine protected areas that were designated for the protection of cold water corals in the UK. And it was an area that were interested in because the cold water coral reefs are expected to be particularly sensitive to impacts of ocean acidification as well as temperature and, and of those seven marine protected areas there's only one of those that when we looked at it through some modeling studies that had taken place that may be um, still in non-corrosive waters by the end of centuries so potentially quite a significant issue for the protection of these corals at the existing sites that they're in. Another aspect we looked at was how the composition of a feature might change within an MPA. So, for example, with the spread of um, sargassum, whether that be in the local context or more globally, then there's potential there for detrimental impacts on marine diver diversity and some of the other species that we're trying to protect. Thinking about whether features are lost or gained to a site, then um, an example in the UK is looking around kelp beds. We have some um, Southern species that have, you know, kind of involved different ecological processes and are more or less kind of resilient to things like storm damage. So as the makeup of beds perhaps changes over time as, as climate change um, takes hold from um, some of those more southerly species moving in at the expense of some of the northerly ones, and this could alter the makeup of kelp beds and some of the ecology that surrounded it. And finally, when a feature actually becomes loss from um, the entire UK marine protected area network then again this is going to cause issues in terms of some of those designations or indeed um, reciprocally some things could expand within the UK marine protected area so we need to think about how some of those management options change over time. So kind of moving on from thinking about what the impacts might be onto some of the management implications for marine protected areas then um, where some of those um, MPAs are designated for multiple features and some of those might be lost, then you know, the potential is there that we might need to think about revising some of those designations around there. So an example in the UK that, that we'd use was um, a place called the Small Isles Nature Conservation Marine Protected Area in Scotland, which is designated for um, nine features, a mix of habitats and species there. This includes horse muscle beds, um, northern feather star aggregations and some of the mixed substrata and shelf deeps that make up the, the area. And these features are expected to respond uh, essentially quite differently to climate change. So the makeup of that um, MPA and, and that mix of designations might need to change over time. Where an MPA is designated for a single specific feature and that's lost, that might lead to abandonment of the site and alternative sites might need to be found. So. In the UK, an example is of the um, Lesser Sand Deal. So it's in one area called Turbot Bank, Nature Conservation Marine Protected Area, off the northeast coast of the UK. It's the only feature that's um, protected there. And certainly well known, there's been a lot of discussion in the UK about the potential impacts of climate change on 
lesser sand hill, including some of the changes that, that we'd seen in previous years. So there's certainly concern about how that might change and then subsequently what that might mean in terms of the sand eel itself as a prey species for UK seabirds. Um, and then finally, where a feature expands in its range, then um, where southern species are moving in, again, we might need to think about how we change some of the designations in, in response to that. Looking further on, then um, thinking again, going back to the idea of where the quality changes for, for a species, then it is possible that the quality might be enhanced in some cases. So increasing temperature and certainly an increase in CO2 availability in the water might, um, at least in the shorter term, help support seagrass growth. So again, we might need to think about management strategies there, particularly in mind of some of the, the wider carbon sequestration roles that that, that um, plays as well. But also thinking as well about how that might affect prey more broadly for some of the species that we're looking to protect. So whilst um, some of the habitat might still be um, fine at the moment for something like wintering waterfowl in the UK, thinking about how we protect some of the prey that's important for it might need further consideration. Um, and then finally, just thinking again about where a species moves out of an MPA, but still exists in UK waters. So we might need to think about how we um, potentially add that to existing MPAs or whether alternative MPAs maybe need to be designated. And an example of that in the UK would be for Merle, which we find both at the um, northern and southern extremities of our water. So Merle, if you're not aware of it, is a coralline red algae which can form extensive beds. And depending on the species and their vulnerability to um, the combined effects of acidification and or temperature, then there really is potential there that these could be lost from current sites. And there's certainly um, some research in the UK going on thinking about how that might change both to the north and south of the UK and how those designations might need to change. So certainly that's just looking at a few examples there, but it's quite clear there's quite a complex picture and some unpicking and further research to be done in these areas. So kind of just summing up some of that initial work that we've done in that area around the legislation side, the MPAs features in the context of climate change, then, you know, certainly when we were looking through it, it was apparent to us that the climate change, it was fairly rare where it's being explicitly considered in marine biodiversity obligations and legislations, but there were mechanisms that potentially existed that could enable um, climate change issues to be addressed, whether that be some of the um, you know, review cycles that might be in place on timescales of say five years or, or less like that, or some of the secondary mechanisms that's put in place to um, implement some of the legislation, whether that be some of the international obligations um, being enacted at the national level or some of the national level legislation itself, where some of these things could be um, considered in more detail. Looking at the issue around MPAs and features, then some of the key features that um, were elements there were really this idea of some of those features being gained or lost in response to climate change impacts from sites and in certain cases about how that might affect their um, appearance or otherwise in the entire UK network. So thinking about moving forward then, you know, whether this potential need for more flexibility in terms of how response to these impacts was, was something that was certainly top of mind. So we're thinking whether you know, there's options such as designating new sites, abandoning old sites, revising management measures, may all need to be considered a little bit more regularly and um, a little bit more specifically as well in the context of a changing climate. But it's quite clear that this needs to be guided by robust evidence-based science, so we're making some of the right decisions at this stage. And, you know, I think there's probably a need for, you know, certainly more targeted research specifically thinking about supporting management of protected features, MPAs and their networks. It's, it's clearly an early stage or certainly is within the UK. And, you know, that also kind of applies more widely think about legislation when we're thinking about the establishment of baselines, thresholds and targets for wider marine biodiversity legislation that, um, that we're often measured against and thinking about how we understand that in that complex landscape of changing landscape and um, sorry, changing climate change and other wider human stresses as well. So really, you know, trying to think about and emphasize the point that the conversa conservation targets the MPAs are set up for and some of their objectives may need reviewing 
more regularly to ensure that we have the best management at the site level in the face of climate change. And one aspect of this as well, kind of bringing in the research side of things is perhaps the better use of predictive modeling to try and identify why, where features could be most affected by climate change and where they might happen. And thinking about how we can use that to help support effective targeted MPA management. So following on from that, I just wanted to briefly touch on some new report cards that MSIP are publishing on climate change and protective features. So the timing of this webinar is particularly good for us in terms of that because we are launching on the 15th of October. So that'll be Monday next week. So this is really a piece of work that we've taken forward in response to those initial bits of thinking that, that we'd done around legislation and MPAs. And we were asked to investigate um, a bit more closely some selected climate sensitive features in a bit more detail so we can help to develop some guidance for conservation managers as a kind of a first step in terms of how we might tackle some of these issues. And then, so in wider consultation with our, our partners in the wider UK conservation community, we identified seven um, key climate sensitive features. Um, again, a mixture of habitats and species that we wanted to take forward that were of interest, um, both at the UK government and the wider UK devolved picture as well. So talking about Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland within that context too. And where we knew that these features were particularly sensitive to the impacts of climate change and some research had already been done to, to demonstrate what those impacts might be. So in terms of those new report cards that we've set up, there, there'll be seven cards in total, one for each of those features that I've um, just mentioned there. So they're, the documents themselves, they're intended to be high level, highly accessible to um, marine managers and particular people that work in, in UK conservation agencies, but hopefully they'll be able to work can provide some guidance for other people that might be looking to take similar types of approaches as well. So in terms of what those short documents include, they're highly visual eight page online documents that we have. And you know, they kind of set the scene by looking at the feature itself, describing what it is and how that maps around the, the UK space, uh, certainly at the time of writing, going into some of the evidence for climate change impacts that, that we have for those particular features and also highlighting some research needs that we might still have. Looking at that role of climate change versus natural variability and other human, human stressors. Um, and then starting to think as well where we could, bringing out some of the regional site specific examples of change and some of the management measures that are already being taken. Then more broadly looking at what is already being done to help build and support resilience of these features in a changing climate and thinking about more could be done and then taking that forward into some more practical actions that managers might look to to take forward so just a few key points from the cards that are, are going to be coming out i don't want to focus too much on them here because i'm hoping that everyone will go away and have a look at these cards when they're published on on monday then um, certainly the cards work to emphasize how well established it is that you know climate change is affecting marine species and habitats um, and the fact that at the moment there continues to be, you know, little focus on management options, certainly in the context of um, climate change and what, what that might mean. So in terms of the features that we focused on, then I said there's seven cards in total. They're covering um, saline lagoons, salt marsh, merle, coral gardens, um, sand deals, particularly in the context of their availability as prey for um, higher species, including seabirds, horse mussels, and seagrasses as well. And part of the reason why we selected these particular habitats and species is that they, they represent some of the, the most important protected features that we, that we have. And among some of the ecosystem services that they, they provide, they have a wide ranging role in terms of supporting diverse plant and animal communities. They, um, they act as nursery grounds for fish and shellfish, including important commercial species. They play a critical role in the global carbon cycle, and particularly in terms of that role looking at blue carbon and 
um, sequestering and storing carbon and they provide food for high trophic levels as well. And I think certainly as a general point, the cards were emphasizing the need for holistic approaches that were reducing other man-made pressures, giving due consideration to climate change that we understand particularly during marine planning exercises and that is able to build in that element of flexibility that can respond to some of the changes that are taking place. And finally, thinking forward to some of the broader actions that were highlighted without going into detail on each of the seven cards themselves, then certainly again, emphasizing this, this role that's already been played through efforts to reduce other pressures and some progress has certainly been made in that um, area in the UK on vulnerable habitats and species is certainly important. So thinking about things like the recreational pressures that we've got on salt marshes and how that might be reduced and thinking about things like fishing pressures on sand deals and wider impacts on things like coral gardens and horse mussels as well. Um, more specifically thinking about things like sand deal stocks and how we might need to set aside some component of that to avoid some of the adverse effects on dependent predators, given their important role that they have in terms of food source for things like puffins, um, guillemots, razorbills and shags. And more broadly than thinking about this wider flexibility that might be needed around management of marine protected areas in particular and their boundaries to adapt to that, that kind of more dynamic nature of climate change and um, how changing species um, needs evolve through different life stages and more widely those um, trying to think about how we accommodate changes in habitats to species start to or continue to adapt their distributions under under some of the climate change impacts that we're seeing and certainly around UK waters then some of the areas that we've got things like the North Sea are, are certainly considered some you know of those global hotspots of, of climate change where some of the changes are happening particularly rapidly. I think more widely so there's some of the points thinking about how um, some of the habitats covered by the cards such as salt marsh in particular and seagrasses are acting as kind of corridors for wildlife as well between coastal and marine environments and realms. So thinking about how they need to continue to link up and having an improved understanding of these connections um, is needed really to ensure they're not threatened by climate change effects such as um, sea level rise. And finally, again, just emphasizing some of that, that wider climate change discussion we've got, not only the adaptation side of things, but thinking about the role that some of these habitats have to play um, on the mitigation side of things and the need to have a better understanding of the value that the service that things like salt marsh and seagrass play in sequestering and storing carbon and, and their role in that um, taking forward of the whole idea of blue carbon and thinking about that in the context of, of wider um, climate change mitigation measures. So I'm going to finish on that point and I'll say thank you and for more details then go to our, our website at www.msip.org.uk and as I said with the publication of our new report cards imminent then come Monday then there will be full access to all of these new different cards that we've we've produced and all the information behind it or if people want to contact me directly then we have a, a general um, office email address which is office at msip.org.uk so thank you all right thank you very much paul and i see that some people have sent in their questions so i would definitely ask others if you have questions please go ahead and write those into the q a box and we'll start at the uh with the first one from Brandon Gardelman, who asks, do you think legislation can adapt as quickly as needed with regard to climate change and emerging science, or will legislation always fall behind the current need? Mm, I, I think that's, that's a good question. And I think certainly at this moment in time, I think that that gap exists, and I don't think it's necessarily closing that, that quickly. And it's something we certainly want to follow up with as, as a partnership that directly engages with with government on that need to catch up. So I, I think in short, in answer to the question then, I think no at the moment, I don't think it is keeping up with those, those changes. Um, I think efforts are being made in some of that, um, in the background and so in the secondary legislation and you know, with groups being set up, things like that, but actually translating that into 
action that we can see on the ground, I think is, is still a little way off for many of these, these types of legislation. And this is a follow-up question for me. It, yep. it, um, it appears that a lot of your legislation is focused, as you said, around features, yep. um, which are changing, as you point out. And I'm just yep. wondering if there has been increased interest in, in having a broader ecosystem focus on ecosystems and ecosystem services that yep. might be more inclusive and, and mm -hmm. more flexible. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there will need to be certainly response. I mean, I don't know how how things are particularly over in in the states and elsewhere in the world, but the but the whole notion of ecosystem service, it, you know, whilst it's been relatively new, or the way that it's been branded like that in the UK, it's it's certainly become um, top of mind. So so yes, I think there does need to be a wider consideration of those wider ecosystem effects because you know things will inevitably move around, but they might just need to accommodate different types of um, species as change happens in the end I guess to an extent whilst we can try and adapt to protect some of the things that we want to protect there's only going to be so much that that we can do we need to, to think more holistically like that. And uh, here's a question from Peter Miller who asks can you say something about protecting oceanographic features such as ocean fronts that are foraging habitats for mobile marine animals like okay. seabirds cetaceans and sharks and how those might change with climate change? Yep um, it's not something that we've looked Add in um, a particular amount of detail, certainly in relation to these pieces of work. But I know through some of the broader work that, that we do on MSIP, and, and we look at um, particular issues around um, physical drivers of change, kind of oceanographic conditions and ocean circulation, then there's been quite a lot of things highlighted around um, fronts around the UK and its potential impacts on marine species so there's not much more i can personally say about that but i know that research has taken place in that area um, how much thinking has then been done taking that forward into thinking about um, designated um, features and species like that i'm, I'm not quite sure in that that context but i think it's an area of work where more thinking needs to be done in that that area that's probably not a straightforward issue thinking about how some of those fronts might respond at a, at a finer scale to, to some of the changes that we're seeing in climate. All right, here's a question from Tom Horrigan here at NOAA who says, uh, he understands there's going to be a card for coral gardens. Does this include yes. cold stony, cold water stony coral reefs and cold water octocoral gardens? Um, I'm not sure whether they've been explicitly referenced in that way. So it's particularly thinking about, yeah, coral gardens in, as we have them in the context of um, the UK waters that we're interested in where they're designated off the um, north, kind of northwest Scotland coast. So I can't remember offhand whether they're included in there, certainly using that type of terminology. I think some of the terminology is slightly different in terms of how we apply it in terms of the UK context, but hopefully there'll be, there'll be something in there that's, that's instructive in that sense. Okay. Uh, Here's a question from Melissa Foley. What is the view of climate change in the UK? If it is contentious, are you concerned yep. that climate change isn't mentioned specifically in many of the legislative frameworks? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think at a general level, the climate change issue in the UK isn't particularly contentious. I think it, it, it's pretty well established. I mean, we have a, a still a level of debate about it, but I, I think broadly it's... Um, accepted. I think there has been a, certainly in the context of this kind of topic though, and thinking about marine protected areas and sites, there's been, should we say, a degree of reticence about it because I guess there's been some quite long won hard battles in terms of getting the sites and some of those areas designated around the coast and I guess anything that might potentially affect that, whether we're thinking about what the movement of some of those species might be or impacts on those habitats might be the currently designated. So I, think, I think people are very keen to protect what we've got now and worked hard for. So um, there, there's a challenge there, certainly, not on the climate change side of things, but on how these things are followed up in terms of impacts on um, MPAs, um, the features they're protecting, and some of the um, wider network issues as well. So that, that connects to another question from Yunsu Lee, who asks, can you explain how MPAs in the UK are designed? Are there tools and criteria that have been used in the planning process 
and I would add to that, you know, have, uh, have there been specific sort of size and spacing types of criteria that incorporate um, ecological connectivity? Um, I would say broadly yes and no to those answers. So in terms of kind of the UK, uh, in terms of, you know, creating the um, marine protected sites, marine conservation sites we've had there, yes, there is, there is quite a, a long um, process, not something that I'm personally involved in or um, so people that I, I directly work with, but yeah, there's a, there's a long process in terms of how those are designated in terms of identifying the sites and the, the size and the location of those, which subsequently goes out to um, public consultation before the debate ensues and we finally get the um, MPA sites networks that we ultimately get and are, are left to deal with. Um, in theory, then, they're supposed to be designed with that element of connectivity in mind. Um, how well we understand how that works in practice is, I think, a bit more open to, to debate as well. So I, I wouldn't say that's quite as, as nailed down, but at least notionally, then, then those sites as they're selected and as they're constructed are supposed to um, contribute to that wider UK network and then more broadly into some of the kind of OSPA networks that we have as well and feed into that kind of thing. All right, thanks. Um, so here's a question from Michelle Grotley, who wants to hear your thoughts on habitat migration, especially for salt marshes and seagrasses. Yep. And notes that in Florida, we're finding that migrations may be difficult due to seawalls and other man-made yep. hydraulic alterations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have pretty similar issues over here. Um, certainly particularly around the um, England and Wales coast, where a lot of the salt marshes are found, then there's a, there's a huge amount of protection, uh, you know, man-made walls particularly around the um, coastline. So actually that element of, you know, finding that barrier and that, that coastal squeeze around it is certainly a, a big issue that we need to consider. I mean, there's certainly um, been attempts in terms of compensatory habitats to kind of um, alleviate some of those issues. But I think overall, moving forward then you know with climate change then we might certainly expect a, a net loss in terms of some of the salt marsh so that's the in terms of the protect, projections that we've got so yes we need to certainly give that a lot of consideration about how we adequately deal with that given there is potentially quite quite a large-scale problem in terms of that and another question related to seagrass from Denise Devota, who yep. asks, um, with seagrass expansion and the fact that it serves as a wildlife corridor between marine yep. and freshwater systems, are you seeing increased invasions of exotic species from marine to freshwater systems using seagrass as a corridor for movement? Um, I don't know specifically in terms of the, the research. It's not something that was particularly mentioned, I don't think, in terms of the cards that we're bringing out at the moment, albeit that link with the corridors was was mentioned in terms of it being important. So it's quite possible, but I'm not aware of that offhand or certainly of examples of that in the UK, UK context. But it would be interesting to, to know whether that was that was happening. And lots of interest in seagrass. Another seagrass question yeah. from Kristen Schmidt, who's wondering if you have any examples of what adaptive management for um, seagrass might look like in light of climate impacts? Um, yes, that is, a, that is a good question. I probably should have read through the card before I did this, this presentation, but- We don't mean to put you on the spot. No, 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 that's fine. But I mean, a lot of the measures, both for seagrass and more widely, were really about kind of um, building, building resilience in terms of some of the, the wider environmental impacts that, that we have. So, you know, in particular thinking about some of the issues around um, pollutants in the near shore environment and some of the other human activities that were going on. So I think in particular, there was a strong emphasis, um, and, I, and I think this related to the seagrass card as well, in terms of the actions that are taking place or need to take place in terms of reducing some of those other pressures as well. So we have some science questions here. Um, okay. 
from Michelle Grotley, who asks, you mentioned predictive modeling will be important moving forward, and yep. having high quality input is essential for effective models. So have you noticed any areas where you really need good data or don't have reliable metrics in terms of um, input for models? Yeah, I mean, I think some of those, certainly thinking about the UK context, some of that, some of that finer scale models that we need. So as we start to look down and think more towards the the site level, um, you know, I think there's still an issue around some of the the resolution that we that we've got within the the marine environment, um, and certainly within the context of some of our latest projections that are being produced in the UK. So we have something called um, UK CP18, which is going to be our latest UK-wide projections that are led by the Met Office over here. There's definitely a stronger emphasis in terms of um, changes in the atmospheric environment as opposed to the marine environment. So we're a little bit limited in a sense by um, both some of that resolution that we've got, um, some of the measures of uncertainty around that in terms of what change is going to happen and thinking forward in terms of time horizons as well. We don't necessarily have a lot in terms of the um, nearer time horizon stuff, although some of the um, seasonal to decadal predictability aspects of the marine environment might help kind of address some of those gaps. So I think there are some issues there. Um, there has been some attempts in the UK to try and look at those parts in the kind of near coastal environment and just offshore where we might expect the kind of strength and direction of um, climate change to be most pronounced and hence how we might expect um, the response of features to be most pronounced and thinking about how that might trickle down into where we might be able to more ably manage something where some of those effects might be might be less acute over time or thinking conversely about some of those areas where we're expecting real rapid rates of change and you know some more serious consideration about how we manage to um, protect features in those areas. Okay thanks. Uh, so here's a question about sort of setting priorities from Catherine yep. Pack mm -hmm. who says hi Paul do you have a specific goal that you would like government to um, to take action to protect yeah. MPA features from the effects of climate change. For example, have you suggested monitor, how have you suggested that monitoring be implemented and have you prioritized specific features over others? Um, um, yeah, not specifically. I think in terms of the kind of wider ethos of um, MSIP, we kind of work as almost like a kind of neutral clearinghouse, not there to kind of try and push a particular agenda, albeit we will within the context of this kind of work, trying to think about what recommendations that we have. Um, monitoring is certainly a big issue as, as it is globally, I guess, in the UK about where we target some of that, that monitoring. And yes, within some of the cards themselves, where there is some recommendations about how and where some of that monitoring should be um, focused or at least where some of the existing time series need to be continued into the, into the future. Um, I think naturally some, some features get a little more attention anyway than others. I think people are certainly more familiar with things like um, salt marsh and seagrass than they might be of, of some of the more slightly obscure things. And certainly in, in the UK on the species side of things, there's a very strong emphasis on the protection of birds as opposed to other um, truly marine species as well. So I think, I, th I think there is a little bit of, yeah, what not necessarily directed by us, but some natural kind of prioritization that, that's falling out there that's driven by particular um, desires, I think, either, either from government or a wider non-government perspective, whether we would specifically recommend to government what they actually have to do, I think we'd have to leave it a little bit more open than that, um, particularly, I guess, as, as we think about our, our role that, that we have in terms of providing that more neutral message as a, as a government organization, as part of a wider partnership as well. So a comment from Roger Griffiths, who says he has praise for the MSIP Climate Impact Report cards. They are impressive products to help increase awareness and climate smart decision making. Is the plan to continue these? And if so, how often? And I would just add to that, I, I have heard some really great feedback from others. And I agree uh, the, the report cards are extremely helpful. And I know others are looking at them as a model to, to also try to better translate the science into 
management and policy audiences. Yeah, no, that, that's great to hear. And I'd like to thank Roger for his um, kind words. I had the pleasure of meeting Roger on a number of occasions at the ECWO workshops as well. And yes, I think the intention, certainly from our perspective, is that it continues. Um, we've been going about you know, nearly 15 years now, so it's certainly um, a long time. And you know, as far as we're aware, certainly UK government and devolved administrations see the value in, in the work that we do and bringing that scientific um, evidence together. So in short then, yes, we're coming to the end of our um, latest five year cycle that we've got, but the plan is to put um, things in place so that we, we continue that work into the future. And beyond the um, immediate publications that we've got coming out next week, we are already in the about halfway in the process of producing our next full impact report card. So that will cover about 30 different types of topics from, um, from the physical environment through to biodiversity, clean and safe seas and productive seas as well. So that again will provide that very comprehensive view, um, boil down into that um, type of report card there. So that probably kind of translated into a slightly shameless plug for these things that we've got <laughs> coming up. But, but hopefully, yes, those, those products continue to be important. And in other areas of work, we've We've certainly rolled out the model working in the Pacific region, the Caribbean region, and we're thinking more widely than that. So, so yeah, I think there's still opportunities and traction to see those kind of things, including um, probably to work with NOAA as well in the future. Well, we would welcome that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, and you mentioned this uh, next card on the full suite of impacts. When would yep. that be complete, do you think? Um, we're expecting it to be published next summer so i'll leave it suitably vague at next summer but i, I would um i would think around july time um as long as we can get all our um, author submissions in and we can harass them sufficiently that they just want to get it off their desk i think a key strategy indeed indeed uh, so you also mentioned uh, overseas territories, and there's a question from Eric Salamanca who asked, are the UK overseas territories included in the UK approach or strategy to fulfill UK obligations relevant to marine biodiversity in a changing climate? Um, we're not at the moment, certainly under the umbrella of MSIP. There has been some previous work done through the um, UK Joint Nature Conservation Committee where they've worked specifically in the UK overseas territories. Um, it was identified as a gap at the moment in terms of climate change impacts in a um, recent UK parliamentary select committee and I think there's certainly appetite to do more. There's probably appetite to do something from an MSIP perspective in this area so yes potentially watch this space but in the meantime we've been focusing on the um, Commonwealth small island developing states given that the UK has this kind of plethora of different random types of um, Commonwealth nations overseas territories and it's it is quite a big complex mix that probably encompasses you know 70 80 plus territories around the world so so we've made a start in some areas but certainly more to be done in the context of the UK overseas territories in particular Great, thanks. Uh, so another question from Catherine Alves who asks, uh, says, thank you for your hard work and for sharing it with us today. What is one of the biggest challenges you encounter when bringing together scientists and policymakers and how do you deal with it? Um, I think that there's, there's always a challenge and I'm sure it's not just the UK that things come on and off the agenda at times. So I guess one of the things is keeping that interest up. Um, particularly in the UK at the moment, there's a very big focus on um, marine litter and certainly plastics and microplastics, which is great because it gives focus to those, those kind of things. But I guess you, you end up battling for some of that, that space with um, increasingly busy um, politicians, I guess, at the moment, especially in the context of some of the changes that are going on in, in the UK. Um, but I think by and large, climate change does remain a priority in the UK, we we'll continue to get that support, which is, which is great. But 
ultimately as well, there's also that kind of challenge about thinking about, right, we lay out the evidence base and it, it feeds into all the major UK reporting requirements and some of the broader things that we do at an international scale. But I've actually been able to pinpoint how some of that work has um, influenced, affected or changed policy is quite difficult to pin down really and actually quantify. So I think that that's a major challenge that we have in terms in terms of how do you prove and demonstrate that policy has responded in terms of what what you are doing yes i can i can definitely see yeah. that um mm. and and related to that this this kind of takes that and it puts it in the international context there are a couple of questions about what do you think that the us or other countries can learn from the uk and then also kind of how does MSIP collaborate with other governments to work internationally to address mm. climate change impacts? Okay. Um, I mean, in terms of the first question, then hopefully, you know, so, some of the work that, that we've done through MSIP since 2005 um, has helped to inspire, I guess, some of the more international report cards that we've seen. So initially we saw them in Australia, and I guess there's been some in other regions of, of the world as well. So hopefully that's been positive. And certainly it was good to see when we did the last ECHO as well, that um, there was reference on in a couple of the talks and it was completely unprompted for us, highlighting some of the work that we'd done with the Industry Trade Association, particularly with the wild capture fisheries industry in the UK. So hopefully some of those methodologies that we've been applying there in terms of um, doing risk assessments, um, thinking about Things like um, fisheries industry, whether that's wild capture or aquaculture, thinking domestically and internationally about sources, is helping to inform what some other people um, are doing. And, and I know from our own perspective, then we're starting to roll out some of that, that work and thinking with some of our Middle East partners as well that we've not necessarily worked from. Um, I mean, when I go to conferences, international meetings, I'm always encouraged by some of the work that's been done, particularly at a a local and state scale in the, in the United States around that. So I think, I think we learn a lot ourselves in terms of what other people are doing. And I would certainly hope there's, there's more opportunity for discussions around the MSIP type approach and the work that we've done with other governments. We've, we've tended to focus on um, the UK situation because that's where our um, major stakeholders have wanted to focus our attention. But I think over time that we're, we're constantly thinking about how that we engage internationally in something that's going to be brought specifically up in conversation in our next steering group meeting in a month's time. So there might be a bit more to add at that stage about where we, where we might take that forward. Okay, thanks. So here's uh, another question from Chantal Collier, who asks, uh, is MSIP looking at the implications of human migration in response to climate change in considering the implications for marine habitats and species? Um, not specifically it'd be a very interesting thing for us to look at um it probably require a bit more joined up thinking between ourselves and um some of those organizations that are taking forward work around you know climate change impacts on things like particularly coastal communities for us um given our remit and you know some of the migrations towards those areas so it's probably a bigger wider research question that's going on at the moment we, we would certainly be interested in some of those links but we may not be likely certainly in the near term to address that specifically albeit we would mention some of those um, factors when thinking about some of the multiple stresses that might be happening on the marine and coastal environment so i've got one question here and i'm gonna Give one more call if anyone has any other questions that they want to submit. Um, and this one circles back to where we began with the obligations and asking, mm -hmm. since we're learning so much more about climate change, how challenging has it been to continually be learning and analyzing new climate change information while encouraging the development of uh, and crafting relevant obligations to address this new information? Um, yeah, very, very challenging. I mean, we don't directly get involved in terms of um, how those obligations might need to change, albeit some of our partners and partner organizations would um, engage in those activities. But from our point of view as well, it's you're not necessarily giving them 
a more simple story or a simple message. So as that kind of research around the Liberian environmental issues on climate change has proliferated over the past decade or so, then um, it's, it's probably providing more questions and answers in, in, in many ways. And it's not giving that single one line response that the um, policymaker needs. So I think we've needed to evolve the way that we've communicated some of those messages over time and perhaps some of the more simplistic things that we've tried to convey in terms of um, kind of uncertainty and confidence assessments we've put around some of our pieces of work that we've done and our understanding on different topics. We've needed to augment that more with more of those kind of one-to-one -one conversations. You can't just leave it at having that information out there and not adding a little bit more to that because the end user doesn't know what to do with it. So I think certainly some of the more prominent members of our um, community are trying to take forward those conversations with with government and trying to make it clear how those things might need to change over time but there is certainly a long long way to go but we can't just do nothing because it's complicated and that's not a new message but um i think you know the need to act, to act becomes um increasingly relevant over time and we're certainly familiar here in the u.s with the challenge of um levels of protection. You mentioned that yep. the UK network is primarily multiple use, mm -hmm. uh, as, as yep. ours is in the US, and yet we're hearing a lot from the scientists of the value of no-take areas for reference yep. sites mm -hmm. and for greater levels of protection when you have these multiple stressors. And yep. I'm wondering if you're starting to hear more uh, or, or have that be more part of the discussion uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the network, given the sort of multiple stressors that all yep. MPAs are dealing with. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's I think it's difficult, and I think in the UK context, that, that situation isn't necessarily going to change. We certainly have a pretty busy space in our um, waters around around the UK, and I'm not sure what what's going to give on that on that front. But yeah, so I, I think it's just going to be continued dialogue in there, and just trying to you know emphasise some of those issues, and, and yeah, I mean. I guess just trying to give a little bit more certainty where we can and, and try to understand about how things are changing against, you know, baseline different things like that, particularly where we've got that reference point of no take zones where there hasn't been other um, human influences there to, to get some of those messages home. But it's, it's going to be um, probably quite a long time from coming, I think. And I'm, I'm sure that would be true anywhere in the world, not just within the UK context so it'll be interesting to know what is happening in other places around the world and what we can learn from any of the um, progress that's being that's being made there yeah agreed all right well i think we have addressed all the questions and thanks to all those who sent in their questions it was great discussion and thanks so much paul for joining us and sharing this information and we're looking forward to the release of the report cards on monday so lovely thank you thank you everybody yeah, i really appreciate the opportunity to um, to share this with you all right thanks everyone goodbye Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.